Yeah, no worries. Um, so I'm Daniel and I'm the chair of North Tyneside Youth Council's main committee. So back in 2019, our group decided to make a short film to help reduce the stigma around asylum seekers and refugees in our borough. And this came about after being told that one of our committee members had a friend who was an asylum seeker in our area. So coincidentally after this, a new member joined our committee and she spoke about moving to the UK as an asylum seeker and how she now thinks that things need to change. So the idea of creating this video was to be, for it to be used in the schools and um, shown to students and to help spread the message of ending discrimination through the borough, help beat racism and discrimination in the area, but also to help make asylum seekers and refugees feel welcome so they know that they are not alone. So that's just a little bit of background to why we decided to make the film and I um, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Daniel. That's a really brilliant and solid, clear introduction. Um, so uh, the next thing we're going to do is, now that we're actually recording properly, we're going to go around the panel and I've just got names on a list of paper. So uh, I think we'll just go in that order and then that way people don't end up speaking over each other. Um, but if you could just give a wave so that visually everyone can kind of just uh, see who you are and where you are on the screen and then just say a little bit about yourself and um, why you are on this panel today, that would be really helpful for the rest of the conversation so people kind of understand what perspective you're coming from. So um, Shard, can I start with you, please? Do we not have Shard, Anne? I can't see Shard. She did see this morning that she was coming this evening, so perhaps she's having problems getting online. No but problem. Um, I will, uh, just while the rest of the panel introduce themselves, I will uh, just go and check on my emails just to make sure she's not been in touch with me. Abigail, I'm sorry then, can you take the lead and start? Um. Hi. I'm Abigail Akinyemi and I am part of North Tyneside Youth Council's BAME Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, next, um, John, would you like to just introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, um, evening everyone. I'm John Akinorobo. I used to live in North Tyneside, um, moved there when I was 13 in 2006. And, and I had the um, pleasure of being the first young mayor in the borough. I um, currently live in London and um, yeah, I've been down here for a while. So yeah, I think I'm quite excited to be part of the panel. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, that's an amazing achievement to be the first uh, elected young mayor. Do you have a, a former mayor title that we have to call you by for the rest of the <laughs> evening? <laughs> your, <laughs> your former highness. Um, uh, Next, we have elected mayor Norma Redfern. Please, could you just say hello and introduce yourself a little bit? Sorry, Norma, you're on mute. Hello, everyone. And John, it's amazing to see you. And I'm so pleased you're doing so well. Well done, well done. Um, I'm Norma Redfern, I'm the elected mayor. And um, I just want to say, well done to whoever made that film. It really is excellent. And I hope it will be shown to our members, all our members across the council and other groups in the borough. And it's really nice just to hear what young people have to say and what they feel about things. Because uh, I just think together we can make a difference. And that's why I'm here to listen to what's been going on and how we can help actually make life better for everyone. Thank you. Very well said. And I'm sure echoed by quite a, a lot of other people here who haven't yet seen the film. Um, it's an incredible achievement by the young people who've made it. Uh, next on my list, I've got Councillor Peter Ely. Please, could you just say a quick hello? Hi, it's Peter Early. Oh, uh, apologies, Early. Um, I'm, I'm Councillor Peter Early. Um, I'm uh, part of Mayor Redfern's cabinet, so I am the cabinet member for children, young people and learning, and obviously that covers things like children's services, and so we uh, support and look after uh, child asylum seekers and refugees as part of our, our work. 
Thank you. And we have uh, Toby Hartigan Brown, please, from Housing. Hiya, um, Toby's fine. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm from Housing. I'm responsible for looking after our council mm -hmm. tenants within North Tyneside Council. That is also and does include in supporting um, some of our refugee and asylum uh, seekers within their accommodation, but also supporting some of our, um, our registered providers also within North Tyneside Council for our, for our Syrian refugee scheme and our Afghan scheme as well. Thank you. Uh, and then I've got um, Anne Alden, please. Hi, my name is Anne Aldo and I work in education as part of the School Improvement Service. Okay, thank you, Anne. And then um, returning from, I think you've been to two of our discussion events now, Aruba. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself and uh, explain to everyone why you're so relevant and amazing for these panels that we've been doing? Thank you. I think that did the introduction for me, but thank you so much for that. <laughs> I run an organization in the Northeast which helps asylum seekers and refugees get back into education, whether it be a college or whether it be universities on scholarship. So that's me. That's a brief introduction for myself. Thank you. Otherwise, Victoria did the best one. <laughs> um, no, I should say that we've, we've done several of these events now, these Digital Me Discusses, which have accompanied different themes. And thankfully, uh, we've been lucky enough to work with Aruba on several of them because of the varied work that she does within the Northeast community. So um, I'm going to begin with a, a question, and this is to all of the panel. Uh, we haven't got a huge panel today, so I'll kind of just leave it open and um, we'll just kind of work to whoever gets there first. Um, so would anyone like to give their thoughts on the making of the film or reflections on any of the issues raised in the film? Just to kind of kick us off, what what did you think of, of the film we've just watched? I think it was it was really, really very powerful. And I think part of its power is that it comes from young people themselves and um, young, young people who have lived experience as asylum seekers or refugees. Um, I think too often, um, as adults, politicians, or officers, etc., we um, we uh, have a certain worldview that imposes solutions, um, and uh, so any any time we can get a perspective that comes from the young people themselves is, is very valuable as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Uh, anyone else care to add to that? Yeah, um, Norma, I, I, I just thought it was excellent to be quite honest. And these are young people, but they're extremely mature to be quite honest. And I, I do hope that this is shown to a number of people and a number of organizations, because quite, quite often, you know, and young people's voices are never heard. So to have the opportunity to present it to different groups of people is really important. And it does send it across some very, very honest messages and actually talks about how people actually feel. And I, thought, and I think that's really, really important. So I do hope and that, well, I know we will. We will definitely hear. We have some amazing young people and we will make this go right across our council anyway. So thanks very much. Well done. Uh, what about someone who identifies as a young person? Uh, would you like to reflect on any of the comments that you've heard? Um, I'm quite glad like people actually enjoyed the film. I do think the topic is really important because usually it is quite like hush hush. No one wants to talk about it because everyone has such opposing opinions about it. But that's why the conversation needs to be like out there and we need to talk about the discrimination because no matter what side you're on you can't agree that the discrimination is right thank you um john or daniel do you have any feedback to give on the film or on any of the comments so far yep um yeah i'm not sure if i what, what side i follow if i'm a young person or not but yeah um, definitely um 
I enjoy the film. I um, think it's a very um, good film that talks about something that's very, very um, topical in, in our community and in, in the UK as a whole. Um, it, it opens up the opportunity for people to debate and that's the important thing for people to talk about these issues and to be able to, to express how they feel. So yes, very good. Okay, any other comments from any of the panel? Aruba? Can I just add, I do agree with John, uh, Mayor John actually, and uh, Mayor Red. Um, one thing that hasn't been highlighted in all of this discussion is that how young people actually feel, which makes them isolated as well. So that's one thing that we need to reflect on. Like I've worked with asylum seekers for the last year and honestly, their stories are, they make you cry. Like I've listened to them, I've been there with them, I've helped them get ahead in life, I've developed courses along them. And it's just this video, it's a very, very good job done. It shows how they feel, but at the same time, how many of us are actually feeling that at this point? That's the only thing uh, might as well, like if you guys think about it, some of us are really lucky. We don't have to feel that way, but some of us feel more because we have those kind of emotions. So maybe like what we hear around in the news or sometimes that doesn't even come around in the news. Some people are, they just trap themselves in these emotions and it, there's no way to come out of it. So. Uh, like Mayor Red actually said, we there needs to be a lot done on this point at this um, at this current time, and hopefully, if you need any of my help, I will be there to assist you along the way to make it better or give these people a voice at this point. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Anne, just because you work in education, obviously you have a particular perspective on experiences of young people from from that point of view how, how did you see the film working? Yeah I thought the film was excellent I think it is really really important that we hear um, not just via this film but we find ways of, of talking to our young people um, and hearing more than just this film that we that this isn't just a one-off that we regularly ask these young people um, how they're feeling and you know just in terms of it um, I'm not sure this ever come up in conversation about how they how they feel and how they've been welcomed into their schools. I'm I'm hoping that it's well and that they are happy where they are. Um, I do have some questions about that. How that happens in terms of how we decide where these young people go to school and and what voice they have in that. So yeah, it was interesting. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, uh, Toby, do you have anything to add in terms of what you've seen or how it relates to your work? Um, it's actually quite, I mean, the video itself is quite powerful. I thought it was really good to hear, obviously, from both perspectives, from, from being a re re refugee or from those, um, how they see refugees are looked upon as when they come in. And it's great to hear that young voice. Um, from a perspective from where I've come from, though, in relation to dealing with families, which include obviously young children and, 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 the, and the parents within the household, um, it's, it's very interesting to know the background and it's, it's quite opening and understanding because I think it was mentioned in the video about the myths about people um, with this scene described and when actually get to understand what's going on um, and the background and the skills and what they bring actually is positive um, in, in relation to their life skills is really good and understanding but I think it's just getting that message out more um, and, and engaging more people um, in relation to that and I think until you understand the stories and understand the background behind it then I think we won't get more uh, wider education out there um, for people truly understanding because I think in the video which was really uh, great was about a country as we are with with the freedom of running water the freedom of having the, the ability to have all what we take for granted um, yet is perceived again when people come into the country that they're here to take uh, jobs money not contribute and, and that's really worrying that people think that as well uh, um, but no, it's a really, a really good video, and I'll be, and I think uh, the mayor said as well, be really good to use that video to um, wider than to, after today. Uh, I don't know if 
you are in a position and to maybe just sort of uh, pick up on some of that and just let people know about the video and sharing it what the future plans are yes and um, it was always the intention of the committee to have this as part of um, a bit of a conversation starter in schools so it would be sent out into schools and asked for them to perhaps play it as part of a um, you know a um, citizenship type education or the, the health um, education in school or it could be played on the plasma screen but we just wanted it sort of out there in the schools but I've also had meetings with uh, the Walking With Project who are an established charity who are, um, are currently in Wars End. They've been working for many, many years with refugees and asylum seekers and they've actually started an education programme in schools and I'm liaison with them, um, their member of staff. Actually, one of them should have been here tonight. She did sign up for it. So I'm imagining she's maybe caught up in some sort of emergency because they're all the whole project's run by volunteers. But um, one, one of the volunteers is a, um, an ex-teacher and she's developed a small program uh, which she's taken into the schools around North Tyneside. And she um, had said she would love to use this film as part of that education package. So we're looking at how we can do that with her. Um, because the idea from the young people was always to share it with other young people. Um, but I, I totally take on board what the adults are saying. And, and I think there's probably a place for it to be shown um, to adults as well. I know within the council, there's already um, an equalities um, training package being put together for elected members and council workers. So again, it could probably be used as part of that training package as well. So I do think there's there's lots of elements that we can um, tap into that are already established and we can bring in the film as part of that. I mean, certainly for all the attendees today, um, I'll be sending this discussion uh, in a trimmed down form with a uh, all of the sort of any key bits of information that come up in the chat, uh, any resources people mention, things like that, I'll be sending as a sort of um, summary to, to everybody along with that link. So you'll be able to revisit that. And I will leave the session open between 6 and 6.30 in case anybody wants to uh, network and kind of informally share details or ideas, things like that. That'll kind of be time for that as well as uh, a second opportunity to watch the film. Uh, in terms of social media, um, obviously the, the film will be available in that way as well to reach as wide an audience as possible, because in terms of ensuring that we're able to reach young people, obviously social media is, is our first point of call. But yeah, it really does matter to have uh, key decision makers on board, having the video screened in schools and as part of training opportunities in order to have the, the broadest possible impact. So I'm going to have a look at some of the questions that were submitted now. Um, they were a, a sort of varied bunch, and I've kind of tried to put them in an order just that sort of makes sense in my head. Um, I'm going to open with the first question we received, which is, what sort of parallels do you experience between living in the UK compared to living in your home country? Um, I mean, if there are any people who've got lived experience as a refugee or asylum seeker who feel comfortable answering that question, uh, we would very much welcome your answers, even if you're here in the audience. So I'll just repeat the question. What sort of parallels do you experience between living in the UK compared to living in your home country? Um, I think I'll maybe start. Um... I, didn't, I came over to the UK when I was um, 13. Um, my parents came over, but um, we weren't asylum seekers or refugees, but um, definitely came in a sort of... Um, a, 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 they used to live in Nigeria, so um, they moved over to the UK, moved over to North Tyneside um, in 2006. And probably the parallels are from looking at it as the perspective of what I was as a, as a child. Um, a lot was different, but um, I think as a child, it was just the things that were the same were that you wanted to make friends, you wanted to kind of have fun with your friends, go to school, um, just, yeah, share your experiences, just, um, what is it, whatever you do, play football, is um, the same thing that all kids, wherever they are, just want to have fun and just want to get along with people around them, I think is my, was my sort of experience in parallel that I would, I would say at that age. 
Thank you, John. Is there anybody else who feels comfortable tackling that question? That's okay, we can move on to the next one. Um, so uh, this is just to the panel. Do you think North Tyneside or the Northeast in generally is more or less racist and prejudiced than the rest of the UK? So there's no wrong answer. It's do you think that the Northeast and North Tyneside is more or less prejudiced and discriminatory and racist than the rest of the UK? I, I would like to hope that it's certainly not more racist or prejudiced than, than other areas in the UK. Um, I think um, because we have a relatively small Bain community, um, I, I get our experiences as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a Burana community um, of working and really supporting uh, people from from I think minority communities or less than perhaps some other parts of the country. Um, and it may be that because we have a relatively small Bain community that um, the wider community perhaps has less understanding of the, of the issues and con concerns that, that, the, that, the, that those people face because they, they don't have as much experience as, as perhaps some other parts of the country where there are larger, um, uh, more diverse um, communities. Um, well, well, I would certainly hope that you know the work that we're all doing as as council, as uh, educators, and um, uh, third sector charitable groups that provide excellent support as well. That we're we're hopefully providing the a good level of education to the wider um, community in the borough. Um, and as someone said, just, just to show how you know, um, asylum seekers and refugees aren't to be feared. They, they you know, are people who will make an extraordinary contribution to our borough uh, if they're given the chance to do so and supported to do so. Thank you, Peter. Um, your sound isn't quite Right. Um, so just in case anyone didn't catch that, I'm just going to quickly summarise what Peter had said, um, that we've got a relatively small BAME community up here in the northeast and we are supporting relatively fewer ethnic minority communities, which can mean that there's a little bit less understanding within the general population of uh, issues that refugees and asylum seekers may be facing. But we have an excellent community and voluntary sector that is doing a lot of work to educate and support the wider community and those groups. Does that fairly summarise? I, I caught what you said, but just for anyone who was slightly hard of hearing, um, it was just a little bit off the sound. Um, so next question, unless we have anyone else who would like to add to that. So this is a question for the younger people. Um, you are the next generation of leaders. And what do you think you will do differently to ensure that we have a better Northeast and a better world? Um, to make sure we have a better North Tyneside. I think I would just, make sure there's like the conversations actually like talk so we actually have a conversation that like we talk about race and talk about asylum seekers and talk about refugees because when you don't talk about it that's when like ignorance starts to develop and people have like pre-notions and ideas so just having that conversation having that openness being able to you know like talk about it that's how you're gonna help in the future that's a brilliant answer. Thank you, Abigail. Does anyone have anything to add? Okay, decision makers, I'm picking on you next. So how are you going to ensure that there is a positive handover to our next generation of leaders? I think it's um, 
is listening to our youngers and potential and, and keeping them informed and part of the journey before that handover takes place. So we understand what is happening. Um, so in order to reflect about how we can carry do the changes for now for the positive for the future. So it's ensure, uh, I think it's just key that we, 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 we bring our youth along with us now rather than handing over at a later date when actually potentially them changes could have been done at an earlier stage. So I think it's just making sure that we embrace that at the, the younger community, the, the people, the leaders of the future at this point now to ensure that they can uh, have a, a better start going forward. That's brilliant. Thanks, Toby. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to make, make it very, very clear. It really, really is important that we listen to our young people. We, we actually um, don't know what's important to them unless we have conversations with them. We don't really understand what's worrying them unless we have a conversation with them. And we can't put things in place unless we understand what they, what they need and what, what's important to them. So I, I think the answer, as far as I'm concerned, we we'll have a really good uh, children and young people service in, in the borough. We we'll have um, a good participation group of people in the borough that works very closely with our young people. And I think we have to build on that and actually develop, make sure that it just doesn't say internal, that it goes outwards as well, whatever we're going to do. So more people feel involved. But, but I, I think it's wrong for us to say we have the answer. They, they will work with us as partners to make sure that the journey they go on will ensure that they have everything they need to get them to their full potential. Thank you. Um, so final question that we had submitted in advance, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. And I already have a question that's come from Bex in the chat so I'll make sure that's our first audience question but the last of our emailed questions if you had three wishes to grant what three things would you like to see happen in the north east to make a difference to the lives of people who first come to the borough as refugees or asylum seekers So it could be one person, one wish, or I don't mind if one person wants to tackle all three wishes, but what would you like to see across the North East and North Tyneside to make a difference to the lives of people who first come to the borough as refugees or asylum seekers? What would you change? What would you add? I think I would like to see um, the situation where they were universally welcomed and, and embraced by um, the people of the borough, um, that they were helped and supported um, within their local communities, but also obviously by organisations like council, third sector groups, etc. Um, and secondly, I think for me, there's something around um, being able to support those 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 people, those young people, um, and perhaps a system that allows us to get that funding in advance of their arrival in the borough, um, so that we can prepare um, for their arrival and put support packages in place. Whereas at the moment, really, we, we are, the funding comes with the arrival of, um, say, an unaccompanied child uh, re refugee. So. Uh, we don't get the money in advance, so that doesn't allow us to make some of the preparations that in advance, I think, that would, would be helpful. Um, and, the, and the final thing for me is about making sure that we have a system that supports them ongoing, so after they um, perhaps cease to become asylum seekers or refugees, so they get leave to remain or citizen status, that we don't just assume that that's job done and that we go on and, and, and maintain contact with them and go on and provide support you know uh, throughout the rest of their time in the, in the borough. Thank you. Um, from the perspective of Anne from education or, or Toby from housing if you had one two or even three wishes to change the sector that you're working in what would that be to improve things? I think I would like what's be become more clear to me this year is um, the voice of the child in deciding 
where they would like to go to school and what their interests are and who can promote their best interests. And I think that's a little bit ad hoc at the moment. And I would like to say that, um, that we were more involved with having those conversations about education with children and not just presuming that they will always go to their nearest school um, to give an opportunity to, to explore all of the um, all of the opportunities in the borough. Uh, that doesn't happen at the moment, so I'm quite interested in how we could make that happen. Yeah, from, from my perspective, um, from a housing point of view, it's actually Councillor Early um, and, the, and the panel member said earlier on about is that support beyond um, it, it, not so much maybe um, as much assistance, but making sure that we, 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 we liaise them through their journey of while living um, uh, as a resident within North Tyneside, that we, that support still continues. And actually the, the, the support we do provide at the moment is not actually externally funded to something maybe we would like to consider um, with the officers we have to support they are being more than a permanent um, employees rather than, uh, than, 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 than external funded. That would be my wish. Thank you. Um, Anne, and then uh, Helen in the audience had a, a point she wanted to make. So Anne, can I just come to you next? Yes, um, my wish is probably, if, when it is a wish and um, not likely to totally happen, but I would like the media to tell the truth and not to mislead people and not to cause this um, fear and hatred amongst people because they read stories in the newspaper which aren't true. And I would like to see some true facts out there about people's lives so that people do feel as if they want to welcome people because they've got a better understanding of the true story and they're not fearful of people coming to the country and they're going to realise that people come to the country are going to work hard and contribute and really make a difference. And I would like to see that side of things out in the media, as opposed to some of the nasty things that are in the tabloid press. Thank you. And just in response to that, I think it's uh, quite a powerful thing that we're using the power of the media by making this digital film to try and tackle some of those perceptions that are created and certainly reinforced and entrenched through the mainstream media. Uh, Helen, you had a point you wanted to make. Hi, yeah, uh, sorry. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm from Hartley Power in Hartlepool. We work across the two sides. Um, we've got a, a really good community in Hartlepool where we've got lots of lots of people coming from asylum seekers and refugees, and we do lots and lots of work with them. But I'd love to see us have from a VCS sort of third sector point of view, being able to give us that little bit extra power to support those people that are coming in. Um, so you know, whether that be um, you know, giving them an extra link worker or whatever, you know, being able to help that individually. We work really close with our local authority um, and we offer the people who come in really good support. We have like a buddy system. So people who've been here a while buddy up with people who've just arrived and um, we offer them a lot of support. But I'd like to say that across the board. And like to say that, you know, you've got people who are coming in and who are genuinely worried, but being able to have us, you know, contact people of authority instead of just saying, well, these are the people you need to speak to. A lot of them find it quite intimidating to talk to the people who are sort of in immigration or who are in a point of um, a point of power. They, 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 a lot of them find that quite intimidating. So I, that's where I'd like to see anyway. Thank you very much. Um, I do need to move on to a couple of questions that we've had in. So Brenda, if you just bear with me two minutes, I'll get uh, these next couple of questions and then I will come back to you. Um, Bex has asked uh, from the audience, uh, how can and do creative arts projects contribute to the lives of communities and what do we need to do to ensure those who have been asylum seekers or living a refugee experience are able to inform and coordinate those projects oh sorry uh, co-create those projects so it's kind of a two-pronged question so the first part is about the creative arts and contributing to communities 
And then the next part is specifically around refugee and asylum seeker participation within those projects. So does anyone want to pick that one up? I, I just want to, can I just come in there? I want to say, I think the creative arts has a great deal to offer, to be quite honest. And it's a way of getting people together and sharing their talents and their skills. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we, we uh, last year started for the first time uh, a North Town Side Together Festival, where a lot of people came together in, with different skills and, and different um, things to offer. And it was a way where different parts of the community came together and started sharing. And we're building that on, for building it on to next year to make it even better. But it wasn't just about one culture, it was about all cultures come together on this huge event, sharing their skills and sharing their talents and their arts. And I would like to see a lot more of that going on. Yeah. Uh, Aruba, you were going to add something to that as well? I was actually. Uh, I've actually come across this pilot uh, that's being done, or it was done actually two years ago, and now it's do uh, being done again. It's where people come together from different backgrounds in a room, and they're given a topic, and then they make a picture, make something from the materials provided. Uh, they're given the list of the materials before. They're given the materials and then they have to explain what it is. So that way people are not only sharing the emotion, they're also sharing their perspective. And uh, actually, um, I've come across this um, two years ago down in Bristol, someone uh, did a pilot, an organization did this pilot as well and they had participants it was called something in politics I, I don't remember the exact name and they did this um art course for three days after that three days they had to make any kind of art whether it be digital or it be hand-drawn and people actually showed if it was um there was an exhibition afterwards they showed what their feelings were, how they were being uh, treated within the country. They, it showed how they had uh, evacuated their own country. So it had the whole perspective in just three days. And then anyone, it was a free event, anyone could come and see it, see it at that point. So that's one way we can co-create this project. I just want to add from the point of view of work that I know that Digital Voice does, and I know um, Claire, my colleague, who's actually a coordinator of several projects that this would touch on, when we bring people on board to make a film with us, the number one question we start with is, what do you want to make the film about? How does you want that film to look? And, you know, ultimately, what do you want that film to then do once it's made? So the co-production runs right through it. And certainly other work I've seen within the arts, from the point of view of the artists, the intention is always to co-produce the work and create something that's inclusive. But I think there's often um, a gap when it comes to recruiting people onto those projects who are from ethnic minority, refugee, asylum seeker backgrounds, whether that's a lack of awareness or they're not in the networks where those projects tend to get shared. Um, does anyone want to pick up on that point of sort of a lack of information and resources to enable people from a refugee and asylum seeker background to engage with projects? Bex, I've seen you've turned your camera ready. Do you want to pick up oh, yeah. on any of those answers and um, bring I that forward? Thanks, Victoria. I missed some of them because I my internet went. So I kind of um, Aruba. I sort of missed some of what you were saying. You were, and, and then I cut, off, cut out and came back in. But I suppose what I'm really interested in is is that shift of, like you say, Victoria. Once people are in 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 a process together, then you can start negotiating how things might work and what might happen. And there's that bit before, isn't there, where there are you know there are all sorts of needs that need to be met um when people are have relocated and um and need to obviously you know need housing need all sorts of um 
support that have to be met and i wonder where we place as a as a society the need for us to be uh, creating meaningful lives beyond at, at the same time and also beyond those kind of very physical important needs and where that sits in our priorities in terms of living the best lives we can live um so how yeah like you were like you were saying victoria how we how people are in the spaces where they get to uh, bring all of their expertise and there they get to instigate a project they get to ask the question what do we want to do or who might we want to involve and shift that kind of that power earlier i suppose that's my thoughts <laughs> I think whether or not it's creating art or making decisions about housing or public policy, I think there are a lot of crossovers in terms of barriers of language, barriers of inclusion, barriers of engagement, um, barriers of even bringing on board other members of a community to encourage integration and an understanding. Um, so is there either one of the other panelists or one of the audience members who has any potential answers, solutions, best practice, things that have worked in terms of bringing people together and making something that's not only inclusive, but also quite peer led. Helen, I saw your hand pop up. Hi, sorry, about it again. Um, no, it's, it's obviously Hartley Power in when the, the local voluntary sector sort of hub um we we usually get referrals from the council so people who come into our area it's usually the council know first that somebody's coming in they'll make us aware we have sort of a little group that people come to and it gives them the space to have that conversation that they'll, they'll speak to people who are like-minded we get them involved in sort of community projects so not just arts not you know we have like people who like to do gardening we have a lot of the conversations we have with the people who are coming in, um, most of them are really highly educated. They're really sort of traumatised by what they've been through. And we're kind of just looking and just say, what do you want? What is the things that you need? And a lot of them is if it's financial support or housing support. We then use our own voluntary sector team to then go and make those connections and get them that support. Um, so, you know, a lot of them, um, the project I lead on is digital inclusion. A lot of them don't have the means to to video chat with their, their, their family who are still, you know, in another country and they feel really isolated and lonely. And it's about making them feel wanted and part of the community and then giving them the options. What do you want? What would you like? You know, these are the things we've already got. Would you like to join in? Um, and you know we try and make sure that it's not just them as an isolated entity as as a group of of you know asylum seekers or refugees we integrate them with other people so we have people who come in who you know people who just want to do some volunteer work people who come because they're feeling really isolated um people who are elderly you've got young people who come into the centre. So we've got so many people who are already here and other organisations here as well. So we, we basically welcome them into the full community and I think giving them that space to sort of, you, you're in a safe place, come and have a conversation and then, you know, what would you like? These are all your options, but what would you like? What do you need? And that's the kind of where, where we come from anyway. I don't know Thank if that you. helps. <laughs> I'm just going to ask the next question, just trying to um, get everything in before we have to kind of wrap up. Um, do you plan to use lived experiences when visiting schools? So I think this is referring back to um, when Anne was mentioning about screening the, the film in, in schools. Uh, do you plan to engage those not currently in education on the subject? So I suppose Anne and Anne, this would be a, a question for you so I'll just read that again do you plan to use lived experiences when visiting schools and how do you plan to engage those not currently in education on the subject well for working in the schools to begin with and um, the film would go in alongside a package with the walking with 
um, worker and they do uh, go into schools with people who have lived experience who um, don't find it too painful to be able to discuss um, different elements of what they've been through. Um, and that is part of the learning and it's um, so much more powerful when it comes from a person with that lived experience telling their stories and it's, it gives them um, young people a chance to ask questions. I mean, as regards engaging with people who aren't in um, education, then you generally have to rely on them being part of other organisations. So it could be that they're part of, um, say, Bernardo's training programme or some other similar type of programme. Um, or you could take the provision into a youth club. I know I've got past experience of where we used something called uh, Fortress Europe, and it was a piece of equipment that came along with um, different activities for young people. And, the, you know, there is things out there and they were used in youth clubs. But of course, we haven't got the number of youth clubs now that we used to have in the past. Um, so it isn't easy to um, engage with people who aren't in mainstream education, that's for sure. But the, there are ways um, by working with other organisations like the voluntary sector, you know, the YMCA and um, the organisations like that who are established and who work with the less engaged people. Uh, Anne Oldham, do you have anything you want to add to that in terms of reaching young people, uh, particularly those who may be more challenging to reach? I think that I would be extremely disappointed if there were any children of um, school age who weren't in education. I I'm not aware of any, and I would be um, on onto that like a shot if I knew that there were children who were out there who weren't having access to education. It's as absolutely vital um, that we get these, these children into school as soon as possible. And if, there, if anybody knows of any, then please feel free to let me know. Um, I think it's that there's lots of opportunities to have these discussions in lots of different uh, forums. So, for example, I run um, meetings with pastoral leaders in, in all of the um, secondary schools so and the middle schools. So that would be a really interesting way of introducing this from that's not just PHSC, that becomes a whole school issue, not just something that you do as like a little bit of the curriculum when it happens to come up in PHSC, but it's more of a thread that runs through practice in schools. So I think that that's important that we share this in lots of different forums within schools. Thank you. I'm going to move to the final question of the evening before we start wrapping up the recorded portion and we go go on to um, screening the Digital Me film one final time and then a little bit of space for informal networking if anyone wants to do that. So um, this question has come, I believe, from Andy uh, I'm a trustee of the Northeast Law Centre, a school governor and a STEM ambassador. Well, thank you for making time to join us tonight because you sound very busy. Um, so the question is, I can see opportunities for education and awareness for young people and adults created by young refugees and asylum seekers. Um, who do we contact to discuss such potential projects? So where is there a good source for next steps? I know obviously we're encouraging people to share their emails and network internally just within this session but in terms of the organizations to go to for best practice for information to know about potential projects where do people find are the best resources to take away today um, um i would suggest um, anybody wanting to create new projects to get in contact with them um, the team at the council who uh, work with the beam task force because this is something that that group um, have got a mixture of people um, as part of the task force, and I'm sure they could come up with something between them. So that could be a good starting point. Um, I, I noticed um, Peter Early has already put his um, email into uh, the chat as a response to that question, but I would be happy to um, put mine in as well, because I do work in the participation advocacy and engagement team. And my colleague actually supports the BAME task force and uh, was um, one of the coordinators of the North Tyneside Together event. So, um, you know, there is potential there for to get something going. And I think for me, I think that would probably be the best way forward, the BAME task force. 
Thank you. Could I just ask, um, just while we wrap up, if anybody has uh, the name of an organisation or wishes to share their own uh, social media tag or um, their own email, uh, obviously no pressure to do so and you are sharing it to a wider group, I have to warn you. So just be wary of, you know, protecting yourself. Um, but just to say, if you pop that in the chat, I, what I'll be doing is sharing an edited version of the chat conversation that pulls out any useful links, emails, resources that have been shared to everybody, just for anyone who may have missed them. Because I know, obviously, while you're following a conversation on screen, it's hard to also follow the chat. So, um, yes, please do share anything that you want. If you just type it in that chat box and I'll collate those all together and make sure that they go to the, the whole group. OK, so any resources, emails, anything you think might be relevant for following up for the rest of the group. And I'll make sure that everybody sees those. So we have finished bang on time. It's six o'clock. I have to absolutely say that I have really enjoyed listening to everyone. I hope you have as well. And um, thank you especially to the panel who bravely put themselves forward to share their personal experiences and professional work and also um, <clears throat> who've taken a lot of these questions with very little time to prepare in advance. So to our young people especially who've made this incredible film that's brought us all here to get, uh, together today and to Anne Grimes who's been the project leader right from the beginning, thank you all so much. Abigail, John, um, who else am I missing? Uh, are there any other young people? Shard, I believe, has joined us as well, and uh, Daniel as well. So I want to thank you all so, so much for attending. Helen and Bex for speaking as well, and anybody else who's put a question in um, and I haven't mentioned. Thank you all so, so much.